Welcome to Is Evolution Compelling? My name is Cornelius Hunter. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is run through a series of uh, a snapshots of the scientific evidence and just see how does the scientific evidence bear on the theory of evolution. The first one, microRNA. You've heard of genes. Genes are usually used to make proteins. About 25 years ago, some particularly short genes were discovered about 20 nucleotides long, if you remember that from high school biology, nucleotides. Those short genes are used to make microRNAs, and microRNAs regulate the, cre the creation of proteins. They can slow down, they can put the, uh, the process on pause. Of course, those microRNAs can't just be, um, be on all the time, they can't just be going all the time, they need to be regulated. And so there are proteins that regulate the microRNA. It's a very interesting process, kind of a chicken and the egg thing going on here. You got the proteins, you got the regulators, they're regulating each other. Very, very interesting. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, when they discovered these microRNA genes, the idea, the hope, the, the expectation was that they should fall into a evolutionary pattern, an evolutionary pattern. That is, the microRNA genes for neighboring species should be similar. MicroRNAs for distant species should be different. That's just the typical way evolution works. Well, it didn't happen that way. It didn't work that way. The microRNA genes conflicted with the evolutionary tree. And here's one uh, researcher who's looked at this in detail, and he says, I've looked at thousands of microRNA genes, and I can't find a single example that would support the traditional evolutionary tree. The microRNA genes are contradicting the expectations. The evidence is, con is contradicting the theory. It is a very serious incongruence. That's the term that they use, incongruence. They're looking for congruences. It doesn't match. It doesn't work. It's an incongruence. Here's another paper where they're looking for microRNA genes, and the typical strategy for an evolutionist is to use nearby species. If you're looking for microRNA genes in species A, you look at the microRNA genes that are already known to exist in neighboring similar species. And you say, okay, they're going to be similar in this, this organism. Use the neighbors. That's the whole idea in evolution. Neighbors are going to be similar. It didn't work. It hindered the discovery of microRNA genes. And so these researchers wrote in this journal paper that they liberated themselves. We liberated ourselves from the conservation requirement, that is, the evolutionary requirement. We decided to liberate ourselves from that. These findings strongly suggest a wide-ranging, species-specific microRNA ohm. What does that mean, species specific? That means different for neighboring species. Exactly the opposite of what you would expect from an evolutionary perspective. Okay. Now, you might, I don't want you to leave here thinking, okay, there's this interesting new problem that was discovered 25 years ago and, you know, evolutionists will work on it. Otherwise, we've got this theory that is working really well. The microRNA incongruencies are typical. It's not just microRNA. I, I give you that example because it's kind of a neat example. It's kind of recent. Oh, cool. Molecular data in general do not support the, the evolutionary tree. MicroRNAs are not the exception. They are the rule. Here's the paper. Evolutionary trees from biological molecules often do not resemble those from morphology. What's morphology? That's the visible features, the bones, the muscles. So if you take and you build an a traditional evolutionary trees are constructed from the morphological features. You take, two fi you take the fish, the birds, the mammals, and you create an, an evolutionary tree based on you know, what you see and you dissect the, the organisms and you build up the knowledge of the, de of the design and you put them into an evolutionary tree. Now that we've discovered the molecular data, we're looking under the hood, they don't match. That is a major incongruency in evolution, uh, for evolution. 
According to, the, uh, according to evolution, the molecular and morphological data should agree they don't. The microRNA is just one example. Here's another paper. The growing gap between the molecules and the fossils is astounding. Astounding. Here's another paper. There are major disparities between the molecules and the fossils. And solutions to this problem are elusive. Elusive. Here's another interesting paper that looked at uh, something called the consistency index. I'm not going to go into too much detail here, but the point is uh, these data points on this graph should be up close to the top of this graph. At the top is a 1. The consistency index goes from 0 to 1. Each data point is a study of 30, 40, 50 species, and it's looking at how the, the incongruencies. It's looking at the incongruencies in that group of species. You want to have very few incongruencies. If there are very few incongruencies, you're going to have a consistency index of one or close to one. What you see is that these data points consistently, pun intended here, very consistently are not even close to one. And you want to be looking at toward the right-hand side because that's the meaningful studies where you have more species in, in the study. You're looking at 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Those are terrible fits. What I just talked to a minute ago was kind of some different papers, quotes from different papers. This is more systematic. This is looking at a lot of species, a lot of studies, here, a lot of data is packed into this graph. And the data are not anywhere close to where the evolutionary expectation is. What's the point of all this that I'm telling you? The scientific evidence contradicts the theory. Of course, I'm just talking about the molecules here. But that's, that's what I've been telling you. The, the evidence, the scientific evidence is contradicting the theory. They're not meshing. Now, what we're usually told in our biology classes and in our media is hey, this is a no-brainer. All the evidence. Do you have a question? So the earlier ones that I showed you a minute ago were molecular sequences, DNA sequences. This one is more encompassing. Here's another paper. Incongruities, I, I explained incongruities. That's where it's not working. <clears throat> incongruities can be seen everywhere in the universal tree. Everywhere. Now, I don't want you to leave here today and think, well, okay, so... You know, this guy talked about incongruities in the evolutionary tree. You got some problems in the evolutionary tree. I'm sure evolutionists are working on this. They're going to figure this out. It's a thorn. It's an interesting problem. But otherwise, evolution is, you know, a, a strong, obvious, you know, compelling theory. The evolutionary tree problem is the tip of the iceberg. It's just the tip of the iceberg. It's something that we can kind of understand, get our hands around. So I showed that example. There's many, many, many more problems with the theory of evolution. It's not the exception, but the rule. Evolution's another way to judge a theory, another way to scientifically evaluate from a dispassionate perspective. Again, it does, I, I'm fine with evolution being true. It's not a big deal to me. But a good way to objectively evaluate a theory is to look at its predictions. Look at the predictions that have been made. Now, we've had 150 years since Darwin, so we've had a lot of predictions from evolutionists, so it's had some time, and we've had some time to check this out. The, evolution, the, the predictions from the, that mainstream consensus evolutionists have made have consistently failed. They've failed over and over again. And I've documented this on my website called Darwin's Predictions, so you can Google that. That's just a resource for you. I'm not going to go through all those. There's about 22 predictions on there that are major, fundamental predictions. These are not you know, tangential predictions that have been made over the years that uh, are unambiguous, and they have failed unambiguously. So it's a good resource. If you Google Cornelius Hunter and Darwin's predictions, it'll come up. It's a Google, it's a complicated Google URL. So, but just Cornelius Hunter, Darwin's predictions, that'll come up. Now, when you have a failed prediction, what do evolutionists do about it? Well, sometimes it's just we're working on it, you know, hold on. But oftentimes what they do is they'll address that problem by modifying the theory. 
right? You got a false prediction? Oh, okay, we've got to tweak the theory. We're going to change a few things. And so evolutionists have been busy changing the theory consistently for years, updating, modifying. Oh, we've got a new thing here. When Darwin proposed the theory 150 years ago, it was reasonably simple. In the meantime, it has become more and more complicated, and that violates a fundamental philosophical rule for science, which is you've got to keep your theories simple. Over the years, over the centuries, philosophers and scientists have pounded this home. Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. You must not allow your theory to become complicated. Well, that's exactly what's happened with evolution. I'm just going to run through a bunch of examples here of how the theory has become more and more complicated. You've heard of gradualism. Now we have punctuated equilibrium. You've heard of descent with modification. Now we have species-specific biology. You've heard of natural selection. Now we have genetic drift. You've heard of common descent. Now we have common mechanism. You've heard of that Lamarck was wrong. Well, now Lamarck is back. You've heard of the evolutionary tree. Now evolutionists are talking about pluralism, pattern pluralism. As one evolutionist put it, the tree of life is being politely buried. What is less accepted is that our whole fundamental view of biology needs to change. You've heard of random mutations. Well, now we have directed mutations. You've heard that Darwin said nature does not make leaps. Well, now we have leaps, saltationism. You've heard of evolutionary mechanisms. Well, now we have the unknown mechanism. Yes, evolutionists talk about the unknown mechanism. On Tuesdays, it does this. This is not science. When you have a theory that has just got so many moving parts and so many special cases, every new finding becomes another special case. It doesn't have the explanatory power that theories are supposed to have. Instead, it's just kind of following the data, making new things up all the time. It's violating the centuries-old rule of simplicity. And that leads to complexity, very complicated theory. It's as complicated as the tax code. Okay, another way to evaluate a theory is to listen to the sympathetic witnesses. You know, listen to evolutionists. What do they say? What do they say about their theory? So I'm just going to give you some quotes here. Here's one book. Origin of Life Research has a dirty, rarely mentioned secret. The origin of life field is a failure. We still do not even have a plausible, coherent model, let alone a validated scenario for the emergence of life on Earth. Here's another one. This is a post at Scientific American. Don't tell the creationists, but science, scientists don't have a clue how life began. This is written by evolutionists. Again, sympathetic witness. Here's a paper. How fundamental innovations originate in evolution remains one of the most enigmatic questions of biology. Fundamental innovations. And that's what it's all about. If you're going to claim that uh, this is a fact and you're irrational if you reject it, this is a no-brainer, you better be able to explain f uh, fundamental innovations, right? That's what it's all about. That's what biology is full of. There are millions of species with fundamental innovations. How body pattern evolves in nature remains largely unknown. Foremost among the unresolved problems confronting modern biology is the origin of biological complexity. The origin of the earliest fish remains a mystery. And we still seek a plausible explanation for the emergence of limbs from fins. The origin of animal form remains one of the greatest mysteries in biology. This doesn't look so good. This is what the evolutionists are saying. And we're supposed to be believers and it's, you know, we're supposed to be browbeat into this. That there's, there's no question this is a fact. The scientific evidence is contradicting the theory. Now, here's an example of a big study they did with um, algae. And they competed, these algae. They got a whole bunch of different algae species. And evolution has rules about how competition should work out. Remember, the competition is at the core of the theory, right? You're competing, right? 
And so they did this. They did this big study. And, uh, well, it didn't work out so well. It was completely unexpected. When we saw the results, we said, this can't be. We sat there banging our heads against the wall. Darwin's hypothesis has been with us for so long. How can it not be right? When we started coming up with the numbers that showed that he, Darwin, wasn't right, we were completely baffled. It didn't work. It didn't explain the results. It didn't help them understand the results. It violated. The scientific evidence is contradicting the theory. Very similar DNA uh, sequences in very distant species does not make sense on evolution. This was discovered a few years ago, and it completely contradicted the theory. I about fell off my chair. Another uh, evolutionist said, it can't be true. The scientific evidence is contradicting the theory. This is what evolutionists are saying. The theory is mandated not because of the science, but in spite of the science. We'll come back to that. Okay, let me give you a little bit more interesting kind of case study example. Biosonar. Just look at how that works. Biosonar. You've all heard of sonar, right? We've seen sonar in the movies, the submarines uh, tracking the ships, ships tracking submarines and so forth. You're sending out sound waves and listening for the echo, right? Well, there is sonar in the biological world. Species use sonar, and it's really cool, very, very cool. Bats, you may have heard, use sonar. So bats are squeaking at high frequencies that we can't even hear. Sometimes you'll hear it a little bit in the evening, but most, for the most part, you're not hearing it. It's above our, our hearing. And they're very sophisticated about it. This is an example, an encounter between a bat and a moth. The bat, this is about uh, one second of time. The bat is flying from left to right. It's about 20 feet or so. So they've tracked the bat and they tracked the moth to actually reconstruct this encounter. And they also recorded the squeaks. So you got the positions of the bat, the positions of the moth, and the recordings. And they break down the recordings and actually reconstruct what the bat is doing. This, they do a lot of this because... It's, frankly, very uh, uh, advanced what the bat is doing. Each little dot here and the bat's trajectory, again, it's about 20 feet. Each dot is a, um, a squeak, so it's emitting a pulse, emitting a sound pulse. And again, this is about a second's worth of time. And you can see that as it, it closes in on the, on the moth, the interval between pulses shrinks. And it gets, as it uh, gets to the point of closest approach, all of a sudden it flips. It switches to a very rapid uh, pulse rate. This is all for good reason. This is all for good reason. So the engineers to reconstruct this are trying to learn the logic behind it. And they have folks who know sonar and know the parameters. And they know, yeah, this is a strategy. It's optimizing. It's, it's uh, tracking of the moth. It's not just the pulse intervals. There's a lot more going on that you can't see in this graph. Um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the intensity of each pulse, the loudness, is being adjusted. As it closes in on the moth, it's backing off on the loudness. The duration of the pulses is changing. So the bat is changing the duration. It's shortening those durations as it gets closer. The frequency is changing. The, the pitch is changing. It's actually changing during the pulse. It's using a frequency modulated uh, uh, pulses. All of this, again, is optimizing. It's all for good reason. It's, it's optimizing its encounter with the moth. Of course, the bat is also flying around, so its geometry is constantly changing as it's tracking this moth. This, this, this moth. So it's having to uh, account for the fact that, that it's, it's changing the, its, its direction of view and so forth. And the, and the range. There may be foliage, there may be other insects around that it needs to reject. So there's clutter, there's the clutter problem. There's the Doppler issue, right? You, you know what a Doppler is, when the train goes by you and the pitch of the train changes. So the, there's a, it has to uh, accommodate or account for the Doppler. It's doing all that. It also, there's a, a new technology in radar came around back in the 
60s or so where they learned how to actually image something using radar. It's called synthetic aperture radar, SAR, really cool technology. And then they learned how to do it with sonar. You can actually image something, like taking a picture, but by painting it with your sound or your radar waves, well, the bat does that too. It can, it can actually construct an image or at least a partial image so it gets an idea of you know, what is this thing. It increases the pulse rate, the pitch sweep, that decreases the pulse duration, the intensity, it compensates for motion, Doppler, rejects clutter, images the target, it's maneuvering, and it's solving an advanced guidance problem as it's doing this. A lot of moving parts are going on. It's a really cool technology. Here's, yeah. Well, in this one, the moth prevailed. Yeah, so the moth has its own, I, I wasn't even going to get into that, the moth has its own uh, anti-strategies. <laughs> right, ECCM, electronic counter-countermeasures is what they say in the, in the defense world. Uh, but this, is, uh, this, this shows actually the, um, the frequency history for just some of the pulses. So you can see uh, early on in the far left here, the frequency is relatively flat. There's a little bit of a curvature. As it closes in, it gets a little bit more curved. It gets shorter. The pulse duration gets shorter, as I mentioned. And the frequency modulation becomes more extreme. It starts to shift the frequency during the pulse more and more. Just to give you an idea of what's going on. And again, all of this makes sense. All of this, uh, engineers and scientists who look at this, oh yeah, okay, this is, it's using this strategy. Other species of bats use other strategies. There's a proliferation of strategies that are being used. Very cool stuff. It's also more advanced and more sophisticated, more efficient, more accurate than our best military equipment. So that's one reason why this is studied. We're looking for nature's secrets to better engineer our own equipment. The idea that random mutations would have constructed this sort of technology is frankly silly. It's just silly. The kind of design you're looking at isn't going to come together by chance. Now you say, well, wait a minute. Now you're getting a little off, off there. You're going a little too far now. Don't you know about natural selection? Natural selection does it. It's not random. Well, that's the story that you are told. That's what they like to say in the textbooks in your, your high school class. The fact is, natural selection doesn't do it in that sort of sense. Natural selection cannot induce change. This is, I'm giving you the rules of the theory. This is what the evolutionists will say. Uh, that's what they, they insist on. Um, your natural selection only works on what already exists. It cannot induce a mutation to occur. There is no forward looking. There is no planning. Aha, we need to get this design. Let's get these mutations in here. It doesn't work that way. Every mutation from the bacteria on up to man has to be random. That's the rules of evolution. It has to be random. It has to be chance. There can be no guidance. No forward guidance. No thinking here. And that's why this is just so implausible. It just doesn't make sense from a scientific objective. I'm not against evolution from a religious perspective. From a scientific perspective, the evidence contradicts the theory consistently. Now you say, well, come on. I mean, evolutionists have to have some explanation for this. I mean, you're, you're giving us all the negative bad news. I'm sure if we had an evolutionist in here, he'd have a different story to tell. Well, sure, he would, and here's a paper about that. The title of the paper is The Evolution of Echolocation in Bats. Sounds promising. Here's a quote. Narrowband multiharmonic signals probably evolved several times independently given their occurrence in several families. In other words, this sort of technology evolved in different bats that are not together on the evolutionary tree. They're apart. They're distant neighbors. So it probably evolved independently. This is about as good as it gets. 
you don't get the details. When you read a paper that's called The Evolution of Echolocation in Bats, they're not going to give you, okay, these are the details of how this system would have come together. It's much more high level than that. In other words, the evolution of echolocation in bats is assumed at the outset. The going in position is, I'm an evolutionist. Evolution is a fact. We all know evolution is a fact. Therefore, this evolved. We're simply going to look at some of the trends. Where did it evolve first? Did it then evolve over there? Oh, okay, it evolved over there too. And then over there it evolved. There's no real description, no real detail of, from a scientific perspective, to answer the, co the burning question, how did this really happen? Is this plausible? From a scientific perspective, is this plausible? You're not going to get that answered in papers like this because it's a given. It's a going in position. Now you say, well, but isn't it a little bit of a coincidence that, it, that they fall into these, ev these, these, these evolutionary trees? It, it fits the pattern. It, it looks like it evolved for just from a, a pattern perspective. I mean, isn't that a little bit of a coincidence? Isn't that a little too hard to believe? Why would God create species that fall into this evolutionary tree and, and the patterns, the designs fall into an evolutionary tree? Is he trying to deceive us? This is an argument you often get. I'm, I'm giving this to you because this is very typical. Isn't that just a little bit of a coincidence? Well, a few minutes ago, I went over the evolutionary tree stuff to begin with, and I showed you how all these incongruencies are there. So really, that, that argument doesn't work. In fact, it's flatly wrong. If God was trying to deceive us, he could have done a much, much better job Okay, it, they don't fit the evolutionary tree. So that's, that's a bogus argument to begin with, but I'm going to show you for bats another example of that. And that's this tree right here. So here is an evolutionary tree for bats. And the organization, there's a couple dozen different types of bats along the top there. I won't go through the details, but those are all different sorts of bats. And this diagram shows how they are clustered according to the evolutionary tree. Okay, fine. So this was all done before you analyze the echolocation. The colors correspond to different types of echolocation. So you got your yellow is short, broadband, multiharmonic echolocation. You got your light green, which is polymorphic echolocation. You got your, uh, your pink, dark pink, which is narrowband dominated by fundamental harmonics. You know, different strategies, different types of echolocation. The colors are sprinkled about. Look at the yellow, for example, short, broadband, multi-harmonic. It's there, 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 and there. It's not clustered. You don't have the different strategies, the different types of echolocation in one set of species and then a different type of echolocation in another set of species that are together on the evolutionary tree. They don't line up. They don't cluster. They're just randomly sprinkled about. In other words, it's incongruent. It's another example of what I was talking about a few minutes ago when I started, incongruencies. It's not, they don't line up on the evolutionary tree. So when the evolutionist says, but isn't it kind of a coincidence that, I mean, how do you explain why would God do it this way? Why, why, do, why do they all line up on the evolutionary tree? They don't. It's a false premise to begin with. It's amazing what you find out when you look at the scientific evidence. All of a sudden, all these arguments just fall apart. The science speaks for itself. The scientific evidence contradicts the theory. Now, let me flip back one. I wanted to say one more thing about this paper. So here's another interesting quote from the paper. Pure constant frequency signals with Doppler shift compensation are arguably the most sophisticated echolocation signals used by any animal. And it is remarkable that such signals and processing mechanisms evolved independently. In other words, because they're sprinkled about, they had to have evolved more than once independently. That's the whole idea behind evolution is things come from common ancestors. 
three or four different species share the same design because they share a common ancestor. These species share a similar design because they share a common ancestor. Common ancestry is the whole idea. Here they're having to admit, you know, uh, it didn't work. These things share a common design not because of a common ancestor, but rather they just evolved independently multiple times. The theory isn't providing any explanatory power. And so one more thing, one more uh, final quote from the paper here, where it just kind of summarizes all this. The animal's habitat, the bat's habitat, is often more important. It has more explanatory power in shaping its call design than in its evolutionary history. The evolutionary history is not providing us with ex explanations of its call design. That is the echolocation strategy. It's the habitat. Look at the animal's habitat if you want to understand. You know, is he in foliage? Is he in the desert? Where, is this, where does the bat reside? Where is the bat hunting its, its prey? That's going to help you understand and, and predict its call design, not its evolutionary history. The scientific evidence is contradicting the theory. Let me talk about the DNA code. You've all heard of the DNA code. This is a table of the DNA code. I'm not going to go through this in detail. You may remember it from high school biology. But I'm going to explain some things about the DNA code. First of all, it is used, as I mentioned a minute ago, to, use pro to create proteins. You have DNA being copied. The copy goes over to a ribosome, makes proteins. Very cool. Now... One problem right off the bat is it's very complicated. I'm not going to talk so much about that, though, because an interesting problem here is that in this process, and again, I'm not going to go through this process in detail, but in this process, there are many steps, and most of those steps require proteins. Now, I just said a minute ago, the DNA code is used to make what? Proteins. So the process of making proteins requires what? Proteins. You have an army of proteins doing this, doing this. When you copy the DNA, you're using about 40 proteins. When you edit the copy, you have proteins. When you translate and use the DNA code, you have proteins. Proteins are being used all along at every step to make proteins. So you have a very interesting chicken and the egg problem. Which came first, the proteins that help make proteins or the proteins that are being made that then go back and do this? It's a very difficult problem for evolution. It's circular. You know, evolution wants to tell a story of gradual construction. You gradually, you know, you get piece A and then piece B and then piece C and then piece D and it all kind of slowly builds up a, a world of complexity and the biological world slowly builds up. That's not what you find when you look under the hood. When you look under the hood at the most basic cellular operations, you get these circular designs. It's not going to work in a, build, in a slow build-up um, narrative. So that's the first issue there. Now, this is an, a notional evolutionary tree, a very simple evolutionary tree. And what's interesting about the DNA code is that it is found in all the species all the species use the same DNA code. There's little variations, minor variations, but essentially you're getting the same DNA code from a starfish to a rabbit to uh, you know, an octopus. You're getting the same DNA code. Oak tree, human, giraffe, same DNA code. Very interesting. From an evolutionary perspective, um, because it's conserved across all of the species, it has to go back to the earliest ancestor. So whenever you find a design in two neighboring species, according to evolution, that's going to come from the common ancestor. <clears throat> if the design is in more species, then you go back to a, an earlier common ancestor. If the design is in all the species, you go back to the common ancestor of all the species. So in the case of the DNA code, it must have been present in the earliest common ancestor, the common ancestor of all life. 
It must have had the DNA code. Those are the rules. That's what the evolutionary theory says. You had to have the DNA code at the very beginning. At the, at the, at, at, I should say at the, uh, at the, at the first, at the, at, the, at the last common ancestor of all life. If you trace back from all the species. Well, um, and then what happened after that? After that, it never changed. Why did it never change? Well, because it's complicated. If you change it, it's going to have huge ramifications. You know, you're using this DNA code to create all these different proteins. We've got thousands and thousands of proteins. You can't just go in and change the code. All these different proteins are going to be affected. So it, it's, got, it, it, it's locked in. You know, it's like a code. You know, if you have a code that you're using in the military, you can't just go in and change it. You know, all these different units are using it. So you can't change it. So the code is not evolvable. And yet it had to what? It had to evolve. So you get this problem of it's not evolvable, and yet somehow it had to evolve in the beginning. So that's a little strange. Can't evolve, yet it evolved. Now there's another problem, and that is because the code evolved so early on in the history of life, it can't be real sophisticated. It can't be optimized. This is something that came up, you know, there were no mammals, there were no fish, there were no oak trees. This is just, you know, the most rudimentary little bacteria. That's all there was on the earth. You can't have a highly evolved, highly sophisticated DNA code. There would be no need for it, and there's not much time. It has got to be some sort of a crude, mundane code that then became locked in. At that point, it was locked in. That's the evolution narrative. And Francis Crick, who is the co-discoverer of DNA, said exactly that. He said, hey, this is, he called it a frozen accident. It's a famous quote. Frozen accident. In other words, it, it just you know, somehow came together, and then from then on, it was locked in. The frozen accident. Francis Crick. Crick. C-R-I-C-K. Crick. Well, that has been the dogma. Here's a textbook, one of the leading textbooks at the universities. The code seems to have been selected arbitrarily, subjected to some constraints, perhaps. But it must have been selected arbitrarily because it was so early. Here's another textbook. The code is then what Crick called a frozen accident. The original choice of a code was an accident. But once it had evolved, it would be strongly maintained. So it's nothing special. It's nothing sophisticated. It's not optimized. It's just a run-of-the-mill code. You just randomly create a code, and boom, that's it. That's not what the evidence shows. When people actually look at the code and how it works, it is very special. It's very, very special, very sophisticated code. It does a lot of very interesting things. When they first discovered it back in the 60s, they didn't know that. You know, it took a while. It was like, oh, it was so subtle. It, was, it didn't jump out at you. you know, I'll, go back to that, I'll go back to that first slide there that I had. It doesn't just jump right out at you that there's something going on here. It just looks like, oh, okay, there's a, you know, it's, it's a code, whatever. It co nucleotides code for amino acids. I don't really see anything special there. Yes, there's some very, very special properties here. Properties that wouldn't help a bacteria but would help a mammal. So here's a paper. 1998. The genetic code is one in a million. That's the title of the paper. Yes, it is a special code. It's one in a million. Here's a paper. The DNA code is nearly optimal for encoding multiple layers of information. It doesn't just code for one thing. It doesn't just code for making proteins. There's other things going on. Here's a paper. The code optimizes a combination of several different functions simultaneously. We wonder what other remarkable properties it may bear.
yeah, we keep on finding these properties. Let's, we're starting to learn a lesson here. It's probably got more stories to tell that we haven't even figured out yet. Very sophisticated. It is not a frozen accident. The scientific evidence is contradicting the theory. It's not working. So the next, the last, second to last thing I want to talk about is um, adaptation. So it's tempting. You may have heard people say, um, okay, yeah, evolution has probably got some problems. It doesn't explain the creation of the species. But at least, you know, the small scale evolution, the microevolution, it explains how adaptation works. Um, it really doesn't. So it's really, it's, it's the, you really can't accommodate a, a limited view of evolution. It really doesn't work that well. So the idea behind evolution is um, you have uh, random mutations, right? Random mutations. This is the way Ronald Fisher put it. The essence of Darwinian evolution is that populations adapt by producing mutations that are random with respect to the organism's need. That's kind of the underlying rule of, of evolution, right? Mutations have to be random. Sir Julian Huxley put it this way. Mutation is a random affair. It takes place in all directions. Their effects are not related to the needs of the organism. Okay, that's the rule. So, how does evolution work? This is classic evolutionary theory. You have random mutations that are independent. They occur in a single individual. They provide, hopefully, if it's not harmful, some gradual improvement. It's not going to make a big difference, a little minor improvement. This is going to be slow. It's going to take you know, a long time to accumulate these mutations to affect some sort of bigger change, and it's not repeatable. Not repeatable because it's a random affair. It's not really something that is just going to repeat. So this is a graphic that kind of illustrates that. These, this is like a population over time of individuals. The, the yellow um, one represents a mutation has occurred, and it's not harmful, so it sticks around, and it starts to propagate throughout the species over a long period of time. This is the general idea of how evolution, this is the evolution you learned in high school biology, right? That's classic evolution. A chance mutation propagates over time. It's not what we find when we look at the way adaptation actually works, the way populations actually work. But before I get to that, I'll just give you a quote from Jacques Monod, Nobel laureate. He wrote, Chance alone is at the source of every innovation, of all creation. Pure chance, absolutely free but blind, at the very root of the stupendous edifice of evolution. This central concept of modern biology is no longer one among other possible or even conceivable hypotheses. It is the, today the sole conceivable hypothesis. The only one that squares with observed and tested fact, and nothing warrants the supposition or the hope that on this score our position is likely ever to be revised. This is in the 1960s he wrote this. Ever to be revised. Has it ever been revised? Oh, yeah. Not only has it been revised, it has been reversed. This is all wrong. What do we actually observe? What we actually observe with populations adapting is environmentally induced change. Remember we said it's independent of the environment? You expose a population to a challenging environment, it changes. It happens in multiple individuals at the same time, not in one individual then propagating. Those individuals sense a change and boom, they change. It's abrupt, not gradual. It is rapid and it is repeatable. Biology is giving us good science. It's repeatable. That's what science wants, 
So this is more of a picture. You've got a population to begin with, you have a change in the environment, and boom, you have a, most, most of the members make a change. That's what we actually observe. So when we say, well, yeah, evolution has some challenges on the macroevolution, but it's, it's, got the, it, it's correct on the microevolution. At least it, you know, it, it explains adaptation. No, it really doesn't. This is not evolution. See in the little fine print I have here? Does not equal evolution. This doesn't equal evolution. This does not equal random, independent of environment, single individual, gradual, slow, unrepeatable. It doesn't equal any of those things. What I'm going to show you are just a few examples of, from recent years of case studies where evolutionists were surprised and they studied and they found out, uh, hey, this is happening rapidly and it's happening intelligently. It is responsive to environmental changes. So here's an example where Italian lizards, that's a type of species, Italian lizards, were, were introduced to an island in the Mediterranean these species were, were just on this, this island. And like a, 10 years later, biologists came back to study and have a look at these Italian lizards, and they found out that they had changed. They had undergone significant morphological change, the shape of the head, the size of the jaw, because the food sources were different. Italian lizards introduced to a tiny island are evolving in ways that would normally take millions of years to play out. When they say normally, that's, of course, according to evolutionary theory, which is actually not normal because it contradicts the science. So this is really a misnomer when they say would normally. But that gives you a flavor. This is being written by an evolutionist with evolutionary expectations. Those expectations are not working. The scientific evidence is contradicting the theory. Here's another example, um, guppies. Guppies have been studied in detail for years and years, for decades, and the same uh, of a thing here. Researchers who once assumed evolution required millennia are documenting species adapting in mere decades or even shorter time frames. Mussels, New England mussels, uh, experiments on these muscles have been, been done. Muscles placed into a new environment adapted, quote, in an evolutionary nanosecond compared to the thousands of years previously assumed. Findings were consistent in two experiments. It was repeatable. This isn't random mutations that happen to take hold. These are intelligent responses. You give me a, a different environment with colder water or different nutrients, Boom, I'm going to make some changes. It's built in. There are built-in, sophisticated adaptation machines, mechanisms, adaptation mechanisms that kick into gear. We know that's true on a physiological basis. You go to Denver, you go up in the mountains for a few days, your uh, hemoglobin will shift. It's called the Bohr effect. We, we do have physiological changes we, that our body will, will, will uh, adapt or within a lifetime. Well, this is kind of a similar kind of deal. It's just across lifetimes. This is uh, yeast. Yeast, uh, this is a study out of Israel on yeast. The, ad the adaptation was due to a response of many individual cells not just one, to the change in environment and not due to selection. This study therefore details a process that is different from the fundamental common view, the fundamental common view, meaning the traditional evolutionary theory of adaptation. It's different. This doesn't fit. Repeatable, uh, this is flax. Okay, so that was yeast. Now on to flax. Flax is another good example. Flax plants have been studied, studied in detail. Same sort of story. Repeatable mutations in flax plants in response to varying fertilizer levels. The identical genetic insertion was observed in five independent experiments. It's repeatable. Not random chance mutations. There are mechanisms that respond. It's not evolution. This is not evolution. 
These events cannot simply be a result of random stochastic probabilities, says the paper. The scientific evidence contradicts evolution. Directed adaptation machines for future unforeseen conditions. These machines, these adaptation mechanisms are there. They don't know what's going to happen in the future. The adaptation machines do not improve current fitness. So the evolutionists might want to say, oh, well, evolution created those machines. It wouldn't have been selected for because they don't help. <laughs> they might help a thousand years from now. So that violates evolutionary theory. The scientific evidence contradicts the theory. 